Hey, buddy. Uh, how's it going? It's good. How have you been? Not too bad. All right. Excited to be here to talk about the future of Web3. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, it's an exciting time. I mean, um, what are the topics that are top of mind for you right now? Actually, you know what? Let's do this. Let's do a brief intro. Concordia Kinetic. Go for it. Sure. So um, it's exciting to be here with you because you've been part Always. of this journey for a long time. Um, I'm, hey, guys. I'm Yuri. I'm CEO and founder of Concordia. Um, we're building the modular risk layer for Web3. Um, initially, we focused on sort of productizing market and credit risk, and that led to kind of infrastructure for building borrower lens that are significantly more capital efficient um, with better risk management than current options out there right now. The next phase that we're focusing on is pulling in um, modern AI ML approaches to really attack infrastructure risk for the first time. Yeah. Um, and of course, we're very proud to be uh, investors in Concordia. So I'm Jahan Chu. I'm the founder of Kinetic. Kinetic is the first uh, institutional investor in blockchain and Web3 in Hong Kong. Um, my history goes back to 2013 when I bought my first Bitcoin uh, from Arthur Hayes on local Bitcoins uh, and have been fortunate to be the founder of the Ethereum meetup here in Hong Kong in 2014. And we're uh, Kinetic started in 2016 and we've invested in coming up on 300 companies uh, in the Web3 space and, you know, fortunate to be uh, seed investors and everything from Solana, Polkadot, uh, Ethereum CrowdSale, WorldCoin, and, and many others. And, you know, happy to continue to be investing through many cycles uh, and uh, still alive, I guess, is, is, the, uh, is the thing. Still alive and 25. Still alive. Yeah. So where do you want to start? Um, yeah, man, what's, what's top of mind right now? I mean, we're about to go into a bull run. We're, arguably, we're in the bull run. What, uh, what are the kind of main things that you're excited for in this cycle? You've seen a, b a bunch of cycles. Yeah, so I guess just to, to round up my personal introduction beyond Concordia, um, I started out in, in the private sector, you could say, after a brief stint with the Gates Foundation uh, at the D.E. Shaw Group in New York. Uh, unfortunately, I, I didn't hear about Bitcoin back then. Or, uh, I'd be a lot happier right now, I think. Um, but I did get into AI, and I left there to go to JD.com in China in 2016 when I had the chance to help uh, Liu Changdong uh, found their first dedicated uh, AI division. And I did get into crypto there. Uh, so we were looking at how can AI ML be combined with other emerging technologies, and blockchain and crypto was just one of the ones that we What year into. was that? That was 2016. So nice. for about six months... I ran a crypto accelerator inside a NASDAQ-listed Chinese company until the first official crypto ban happened in 2017. And um, kind of if, you, if you think back from then until now, um, most, of, most of the attempts to kind of combine AI and crypto back then were pretty much just buzzword smashing. Um, so one of the things I'm excited about this year is that both of these technology areas have matured and become more productized and more efficient in ways that allow more companies to use them. Not necessarily by putting AI on a blockchain in the literal sense, but by using both technologies at the same time for a use case. I think that's pretty exciting because AI is so ubiquitous now that if you can't thoughtfully combine these different data approaches, it's just a sign that we're not as close to integrating this technology into the real world as we, as we hope we are. So that's one theme that I think is really buzzy right now, but yeah, I think is, I is exciting. Uh, as somebody who's been doing it for a long time. Um, another one is, I think RWAs are, are really interesting. Real world assets. Yeah. yeah. I know that everyone's excited about investing into, into tokens that are about to list. Um, and so RWAs are kind of a little bit more under the radar than they probably will be next year. I don't know. I mean, the whole BlackRock. So our, our portfolio company, Securitize, just recently uh, had the announcement with BlackRock, like, you know, trillion plus dollar kind of asset manager. Mm -hmm. That's like, I would think, the most exciting RWA, it's uh, tokenized treasuries, um, uh, money market funds. I mean, it's a, it's a you know, Biddle is the, is the ticker. I think that's pretty interesting because now you can basically have a, a treasuries backed, uh, totally compliant, totally, you know, kind of regulated coin, which can accrue uh, yield. Like, that's pretty interesting, right? Could that, I think that's, that's like a new version of like a, a stable coin. It is, it is. I, I think that if you, if you look at a lot of these buzzwords right now, you have things like, what's hot? Eigenlayer, 
um, AI and totally. blockchain, shared security, modular. modular. Yeah. The, these are all things that, as you as they mature, they'll allow you to build things more robustly and more safely, and also in a way which is more scalable. <clears throat> and I think that. In a lot of ways, when we think about mass adoption, we think about lots of people using it. Sure. But the other side of the mass adoption coin is getting large institutions to use the technology and sure. use these assets. Because then indirectly, that will touch lots of people. So blockchain, I mean, uh, yeah. BlackRock is a great example of that. Another one actually is a, uh, a project that I sort of met more recently, um, Huma Finance. I don't know if you're familiar with them. We're investors uh, in Huma. Okay, great. Yeah. Well, so then you'll be really happy for me to Richard, just, yeah, he's great. I want to call out, you know, Richard was a top technologist at Google, founded Google Fi, four other major businesses at, yeah, at, serious, at Google. Yeah, like serious, legit founder. Left and founded an AI company, sold it to Facebook. Now he's building um, an incredible company that is not just solid infrastructure, but they have an RWA product, which is really scalable. And that's exciting. Uh, I actually connected him to a friend of mine who, if things work out, could put a lot of money into his product. So congratulations. Um, for he's great. He's great. Yeah, you know, we we invested in him. Yeah. Um, uh, I think maybe a two year and a half ago, something like that. Yeah, a little while ago. Yeah, he's great. No, he's yeah, great. They're, they're great. And then um, I think another one that's interesting is there's a group called Peregrine Digital that we've been getting to know. And these guys are regulated under the ADGM. They already have two billion in assets they tokenized. They have a, a pipeline of ten billion. Yeah. And other assets that they're tokenizing, they're in a jurisdiction where you can actually take that and, and make it into useful collateral. Yeah. You, know, put, you can you can put it in, in borrow lens. You know, you can put it in probably the, you're going to see DeFi products emerging that can handle this stuff. Um, maybe uh, maybe you're right. Maybe Ondo Finance doing a token and having it go like that is a sign that that RWA actually can align. I think with, RWAs are actually the, like a lot more present than people think, and yeah. I I think that you know if I think about the kind of themes that I'm excited about, right? Yeah. For sure, AI. Um, but I also think that AI is taking a little bit longer to kind of, you know, kind of make, make itself useful, like, like fully useful in the blockchain space. It yeah. will do. Um, we backed a company called Neural, Finance, uh, Neural Fabric, uh, yeah. which is uh, a registration layer for uh, models, weights, yeah. uh, and kind of data so that you can have a, a better um, registration for what's going into a, an AI model and, and, you know, as it changes, make sure that data is compliant. Yeah. I think that kind of like AI blockchain infrastructure, like using blockchain for AI infrastructure is super interesting. Mm. But I'm, and I think that the distributed resourcing for AI is also in theory useful. I mean, yeah. obviously we're, you know, very famously early investors of Render yeah. um, and they've done a great job. And at the same time, I think that in general, the space still needs a, a ways to go in order to really start to harvest a lot of those kind of gains from yeah. distributed resourcing and, and trying to drive costs down. Yeah. I think the other area that I'm very super interested in is, uh, and it's interesting that you know uh, they're they're one of the title sponsors of, of Hashkey is Ton. Like you yeah. and I have kind of bonded over Ton and Telegram's yeah. blockchain. For me, I think that's one of the most exciting kind of narratives because it has nothing to do with a particular technology. And it has everything to do with like numbers of users. Mm. 900 million monthly active users are now being onboarded into crypto with like a native crypto wallet. That kind of stuff to me, I think, changes the game in ways that narratives like modularity and AI uh, and you know um, restaking like don't. So I'm kind of curious to like how you think about yeah. how things like Ton and Telegram change the game. Yeah. So. I guess just to very briefly contextualize, I've been a, a big fan of Tone and Telegram for, for a while. Um, and actually, that was driven by meeting their leadership team back when I was VP for business development at Binance back in 2021, 2022. Yep. Um, and to be honest... Binance was super interested in Tone back then, right? Yeah. That's what I heard. And I think that they... they I mean, everyone's interested in Tone now, but they, yeah. were, they were interested then. But there was still a lot of, I think, FUD around around Ton and Telegram yeah. for a lot of historical reasons. What was really interesting to me, though, is that they didn't get the credit, I think, broadly, that, that I felt they deserved after I met them for being such incredible professionals. I mean, how many ecosystems in Web3 were founded by people who previously founded multiple B2C companies with well over 100 million monthly active users? I would say zero yeah. other, other than Tom. And I remember meeting them and, and thinking to myself, and isn't it like insane? There's like less than 50 people on that team. Yeah, I mean, and the, then in the Telegram team, the it's execution like has been incredible across incredible. across VK across yeah. Telegram. Yeah. So it's not really a surprise that the two-year roadmap that I I saw back in 2022. Yeah. Is 
pretty much happened as predicted. I mean, it, it's crazy. And I think even the thesis around um, onboarding lots of users, so that kind of mass adoption, has been proven recently uh, more than anything by, by Notcoin, which is a simple, like a super simple, you know, click yeah. driven game. Super interesting. It is now up to over, I checked with them uh, actually during this conference when we caught up and I, I won a hundred dollar bet because someone, I told some, my friend that I, they must be at over uh, 30 million uh, weekly active users. Oh yeah, right they And he's like, there's no way, nothing in crypto has that much. And, and I said, I'll bet you $100. And I just checked and they're, they're well over 30 million. Put that and $100 in about what, three and a half months. Something like that. Ridiculous. Something like that. So I think that they're the only company of their scale in terms of users totally. that's nearly as crypto friendly as their leadership team is. Yeah. And so they're pretty unique in terms of being able to single-handedly drive yeah. the next 10x in terms of user adoption. Yeah. I think the other, the, one of the other kind of areas that I'm super interested in and that we were spending a lot of time investing uh, other than the Tawny ecosystem is uh, it's the Barra Chain ecosystem. Yeah. So we've been, we've been going super deep on Barra Chain. Um, unfortunately, we didn't invest in Barra Chain because we were a bit too late. But instead, what we're doing is we, we've really kind of gone deep on some of the uh, Barra Chain ecosystem projects. So. Uh, we invested in Kodiak. Mm. Uh, we invest. We led the round for Ooga Booga, which is like one of the best names in crypto <laughs> for a company. Uh, and also, uh, sure. it's a Dex aggregator. Uh, and we're looking really closely at companies like like Gummy and Infrared. So, for me, I think there's something special about uh, the. I hate to say it, like the youth no, I, of I their ecosystem and their founders. There's something about the ethos that they're able to drive. Super hungry, super young, super ambitious, very kind of like just degen enough yeah. uh, founders to that ecosystem to have, you know, this kind of proof of liquidity ecosystem. So I think that's also super interesting where we're spending time. So, do, you, do you mess with like Barrachan at all? So, so yeah, it's, it's funny that you mentioned that. I haven't, you know, I promised everybody that we didn't coordinate any of this. Actually, he just sent me the questions like an hour ago. So, <laughs> so there's no coordination here, but. Um, no coordination at all. So, so two things, number one, um, Concordia is going to build on Barachain. So I guess nice. um, taking a step back, Concordia uh, just spun off a module that went to mainnet this week on Aptos, which is great. It's testnet live on Solana and EVM as well. But as we think about where to go and, and what chains are really interesting, I think things like base are cool because they have the relationship with Coinbase. Base is really interesting. It's really interesting. You, I think I'm very bullish base. Um, well, but what do you think about like, it's it. Well, so let me go back to Barachain really, okay, okay, really, okay, really okay, quickly okay. because then we can move on. But Bear Chain, um, my co-founder's been friends with uh, a couple of the bears for a while, yeah, yeah, yeah. and so we've we've sort of seen their journey. And then Tribe Capital was the the, the one of the co-leads for um, our round, and another and they and another one of our um, LPs were both pretty big investors in Bear Chain. Yeah. So we've heard a lot about Bear Chain and, and talked to them a lot, and I think that their execution, I lo I love their architecture, the kind of um, the 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 Cosmos based EVM. Yeah. Um, it's so good for interoperability as well. And um, so I think we're gonna be uh, definitely trying to make Concordia something that can help their DeFi ecosystem to be a lot safer. I mean, nice. what Concordia is doing is really trying to productize risk management so that people can build DeFi without having to, you know, also in addition to being ingenious and innovative, you know, kind of uh, do what, you know, a 20 person risk team with 100 years of experience really needs to do. Um, but we're also going to build on Tone as well uh, as the DeFi ecosystem becomes mature enough to, yeah. to make that doable. That's so cool. you, I, th I think these are the two places where in different ways, we're big fans of the barbell curve approach mm -hmm. for like where value will accrue in crypto. I think that really crypto native, high quality ecosystems, infrastructures and products, um, which I think Barachain is, is one of those, um, are going to be bigger. I think you're going to see a continued growth of that kind of parallel universe of crypto native um, everything, but as, sure. as, as a kind of mass adoption picks up, whether on the B2C side, like Ton, or in terms of institutional adoption, um, I think you'll obviously see a huge amount of value flow in from, you know, large end user bases and then institutions. Yep. The mushy middle, we think is a little risky, like people who aren't really sure, sure. where they fit in. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, I don't know. What else you want to talk about? Um, Let's see. I mean, you mentioned the bull cycle. I did want to mention one thought about that. You asked me yesterday um, what is different about this bull cycle. And I, I would say that it doesn't really feel 
like what we think of as a bull cycle yet. It feels more like a global. I would agree with that. I, I think I think we're still kind of pre-bull. I think this is yeah. kind of like the uh, the kind of early bull jitters. Somebody was saying like, there's no way that this is a bull cycle if we're only at kind of like you know not even 70 70k Bitcoin. I I feel like yeah. that type of momentum just that kind of irrational exuberance, which really kind of characterizes a bull cycle, just hasn't really set in yet. Yeah. Um, I think that we have a ways to go on, on all of these things. And I think that the kind of network effects and the kind of knock-on effects of, of a real kind of psychological bull just aren't here yet. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of curious as to um, what, what kind of catalysts, and I actually think it's going to have nothing to do with crypto, these catalysts. It's going to be like interest rates. It's going to be like yeah. administration, you know, kind of evolution or whatever. I actually think that the biggest, and this, this is actually a credit or uh, a characteristic of kind of crypto, which is that the, the convergence of the kind of macro economy uh, and the overall kind of, you know, monetary cycles converging with crypto, that's actually what, you know, makes the difference these days in crypto. You have all these kind of like sub uh, narratives of like modularity and AI, da, 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 but actually what matters is money coming to the system and that's yeah. not really controlled by, by crypto. So yeah. to its credit or to, you know, for, for better or for worse, I think that uh, the convergence of mainstream finance and crypto actually is here. Mm. Uh, and that's, you know, in some ways what, what was always supposed to happen, that's just really, better. That's so, so two things, I guess, the, something simple and something maybe more profound. Uh, on the simple side, I agree with you. I, I think that if I, if I can be forgiven for using, you know, um, finance jargon for a second, you know, because I started out at a, at a big hedge fund, the D.E. Shaw Group in New York, it, it just feels like a very global macro phenomenon. It mm. feels like people are looking at regulation. They see regulation is clarifying. It will come in, which means institutions will come in, and that creates a certain amount of FOMO that's causing sort of institutions to make moves maybe before retail starts to come up. And so you don't see the retail bump that people associate with previous bull markets happening. Yeah. Now, maybe as the mental model of seeing people make money from this pre-bull comes in, maybe that'll be part of what drives a bigger bump that maybe likely will also coincide with loosening monetary policy and you know, other, some of the other macro kind of tailwinds that people expect to come in maybe early 2025. Yep. Um, but going back to what you said, it's funny you mentioned this. So a lot of what we do goes back to some bets that we decided to take in 2020, my partner, Jimmy and I. Yeah. And on the building side, we took a long-term bet that risk management was going to be important in crypto. And we, uh -huh. did, we did that in 2022, by the way, in the, in the, in the middle of the, of the last bull market when, yeah, yeah. when no one cared. Um, and so we founded one company and then Concordia. And I would say both of, them, both of them had to kind of wait until the space caught up. But then Luna happened, Celsius, Voyager, then FTX happened. And then, and then we raised our seed round two weeks after FTX, right? Basically for, mo for modular risk management. Yeah. Um, I think that... The capital allocation side, which is something that we also, did, you know, had a long-term view on, um, what ended up being the right time for us to really lean into that is now, and and that's through not just a direct fund, but also a fund of funds, which is focused effectively on, in, on investing into GPs, who are coming at this integration thesis that you mentioned. Yep. Right. Um, but doing it in a way where, you know, a significant portion of the portfolio is sort of crypto native investors. But you also have investors coming in from the perspective of you know, other data technologies, AI, cloud, even quantum, sure. and how those overlay with the fastest growing sectors. Yeah. And the reason for that, you know, just for us, is that you have to have diversification, which yeah. you can't really get within crypto if you just invest in crypto funds very easily. But the other thing is, it really does seem like for a longish term view, like a 10 year fund, it's a really interesting time to be thinking about how can I invest in the transformation of traditional sectors sure. by crypto and AI and these other yeah. data technologies. Yeah. What's, uh, I'll, I'll kind of uh, answer my own question, then I'll ask it to you. So out of the money bets or kind of like guilty pleasures in the crypto space, things that you're investing in or things that you're looking at that are either like brilliant or completely foolish. So I, inve I, I, I FOMO'd in or I YOLO'd in either way into Slurf <laughs> <laughs> and like other like kind of meme coins. And I'm like literally, I'm literally, I'm the top indicator for meme coins. When I buy a meme coin, everybody yeah. else should sell because I indicate top. So my, my Slurf and Bonk, and that's, I think I did a few others. What, what, what are you investing in? What are you looking at like, that you I, think is I, both I, fun I, and, and foolish? I think meme coins are the only answer to that question right now. I mean, I, I'm like you. Like I, um, 
my teams are trying to force me to start using social media. I'm that kind of a person. I'm not like a, like a meme coin sort of natural, but yeah. um, I love cats, man. The cat, cat coin season has been amazing, right? Like, yeah, yeah. So I would say cat coins. Never waste it's a fun. good cat meme. Exactly. <laughs> nice, nice. Uh, okay, any uh, parting words for our, for our audience? No, I mean, I think it's, uh, last thing, this Hong Kong blockchain fest feels different. You think so? To me. I mean, I've been to a couple before. This one feels like more people from around the world are coming here for this. I was able to come here and meet many of the people that I wanted to meet for token here. I'm probably not going to make the token. So I think it's exciting to be in Hong Kong. We're really excited for the regulated spinoffs of what we're doing to be engaging really heavily with Hong Kong alongside the ADGM. Yeah. So more, let's spend more time together. Always, always. And, and from our side, I mean, we're, you know, we're investing heavily. We're probably writing two or three checks a week. So we're, we're kind of like not quite at last peak uh, kind of uh, velocity of investments, but we're, we're getting there pretty soon. So, you I know, have some, you guys are I have some meme coins for you. <laughs> well, <laughs> I never waste a good meme coin. All right. Thanks very much. Thanks, everybody. Take care.